we do hit now this point, right? Again, we have finished up the traditional AI section, the logic section, right? Now we are hitting into this point where this is the, the element that is super interesting or super popular right now. It's not that everything else that we've talked about is hogwash, right? Or completely obsolete. No, it's just, it's not, it's not the flavor of the month, right? Again, in fact, if I really just kind of deviate for a second, a lot of what we talked about in logic is now what they're starting to try and integrate into like your chat GPTs and your LLMs and your neural networks. Why? Because it's logic, it's knowledge representation, right? It's rules. But again, how I want you to kind of think about this is if you remember, we finished up logic, but then we talked about the uncertainty in certain rules, right? This, oh, sometimes it's not exactly, you know, oh, this is the only way something happens, right? And as a consequence, right, this is where we started to add a little probability into our lives. And that was where sort of the Bayesian network actually was kind of in a machine learning era. It was not just a fixed thing, right? That's a sec, uh, in essence, where we're looking at, hold on, Chat said hi. I told you, 40 second delay. My point being is, hey, now I have probability. Oh, well, you know, probability was all about this idea of observations, right? Oh, sometimes something happens. I observe something happens, but it doesn't always happen, right? That is where this idea of learning from experience comes into play. What happens when I make an observation? Do I just tally? Do I just like add one to something and we call it a day? Well, that's an approach, but we can do more. And that is essentially where machine learning starts to come into play. Uh, the other reason why I kind of stress this is uh, I built this like picture over a decade ago and it's only gotten worse is how I'll kind of frame it, right? The entire idea is we now exist in a sea of data, right? Think about just everything that we log, you know, again, we all got one of these things just heating up our, our pocket right now. Uh, this thing has a GPS, an accelerometer, Probably a, a humidity sensor. I don't know what, what all's in his, this thing anymore. But right, this thing is just constantly connected to a cell tower, reporting all of that information, right? Reporting your GPS. Even if you don't want it to, right? you know, you don't have it in a Faraday cage. The second it c connects again, it's telling, you know, the cell towers where it is. Well, that's just the cell phone. That's also happening with, you know, go to the gym or the library. Do you enjoy the fact that you can see uh, how busy uh, an area is? Well, it's because what are we doing? We're tracking Wi-Fi signals and how many more Wi-Fi addresses are being connected to a certain hub at a given location. And that's, again, the issue is we're starting to hit this point where just there's so much data all over the place, right? Again, what is it? Uh, the, the term we used to describe even like 10 years ago is we've created more images than have ever been produced in like the entire human like existence. We did it essentially like in that amount of time uh, after the digital camera was invented, right? And yeah, right, this is, we're, we're now swimming in just a bunch of data out there on, in the internet, on, in the world. We are recording everything at hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, microsecond by microsecond. We are just recording everything. And so what happens is this is where, you know, it's very difficult for us to essentially just grab all that data and try and synthesize it. It's very difficult to do because, again, think about just, think about a quadrillion, right? You build a for loop that goes a quadrillion times. How long will it take? 
just forever, uh, uh, in essence, right? So where we start to go is, well, maybe I don't rely on exhaustive. I don't train on everything because everything is a quadrillion or it's an infinitely increasing uh, number that I just cannot work off of. So rather, now we're starting to kind of think about this idea of, well, what if I had an algorithm that does take its observations, but instead of calling them observations, we call them experience. We're now using that observation as, hey, in this moment of time, I did a thing and now it is, you know, was that a good result or a bad result, right? Because again, that helps teach this algorithm whether or not it did it right or not. It doesn't know necessarily. And so where we start to go, this is a little bit of a higher level topic today, mostly to kind of really cover the brush. And then as we finish up the semester, we'll dig much deeper into the individual pieces parts. But this is the pipeline for machine learning. Who here has done any form of like machine learning? You know, they've run a tutorial or something on the internet. Okay, you know, the, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I don't, I can't stop you. And in fact, you should do a lot of that. My point being is, it's this is the part that oftentimes gets overlooked by you know the general public, right? Of all the parts that have to go into it. You'll notice this flow is very different than what you've probably learned in software development. Where it's like, oh, let me get the resources or let me, get, you know, interview and uh, stakeholders. You're still doing those types of things. But like the workflow that happens when you're dealing with machine learning kind of shifts, right? Again, you have all that data, right? Temperature sensors that are just recorded every 30 seconds. YouTube videos are being uploaded, you know, tens of thousands of them a second. Uh, pictures shared on the or you're pulling all of the text in a library. You just have data sitting there, right? But what's the problem with that? Well, again, it's a lot of data in a lot of different formats that I, you know, what's the purpose? What am I trying to do with it? And that's where we at least start with this idea of, well, again, what's your goal? Like, what's the point of your entire task? Do I need all the data in the world. Well, no, you know, if I need uh, just, um, you know, to detect, make it some kind of image classifier or spam filter, then I need to target my data. I need to specifically find only data that focuses in on that specific task. So there's, for example, you know, uh, many different data sets out there in the world where they are labeled. And we'll talk about that in just a second. You know, where it's, oh, here's a sentence, here's a text message, and here's a label indicating whether or not it is uh, legitimate or spam. Well, someone had to label that, right? That's also another uh, thing that comes into play, right? That's where we get into pre-processing the data. Sometimes that data that you're working off of doesn't have a label. Yeah, that happens. Welcome to your first uh, project as a grad student, maybe even an undergrad, where oftentimes you're right here. This is essentially going to become your job for uh, a lot of that, that like first data scientists or data, data science projects, machine learning projects, this is where you get assigned. It's like, hey, here's a CSV file. Clean it up. What does that even mean? Well, again, it, you know, get rid of all the special characters or make sure that uh, you, know, you don't have any duplicates, things like that. But my point is also it comes down into this idea of, well, what if I don't have any labels for my data? I don't have something saying it's spam or not spam. I don't have something that says this picture is a cat or a dog. I don't have those. So what's the first step? Doing it yourself. But then what? Then we start to get into 
running some type of algorithm, some kind of filtering process, some type of evaluation, right? Again, numbers, algorithms happen, and as a consequence, we now find our data. We now, or we find, instead of data, right? We find patterns, we find information. This is, again, now that you've done the processes, right? You have some piece of information, right? Again, the algorithm, shifted as necessary, that is information, right? At which point you can produce this idea of knowledge, this evaluation process of how good it is. So the difference between pre-processing and transforming. Um, so pre-processing is essentially, you'll, we'll see it a few times over the semester or over these next few lectures, but it's all of the little bits that you have to do before you run the algorithm. Is this a, like, don't think of this as this is all the algorithm being built into one program, every algorithm follows this flow. This is more like, here are the steps of this. So you are physically, manually doing these steps. So someone is taking your CSV file or taking your, you know, your PNG, JPEG files, and then mapping them to a CSV file that has labels of like what the animal in the picture is. That's all that is. Transforming the data is now you are now running through your algorithm, you are doing some kind of analysis on the, on the data that you've just done kind of your work off of. Does that help? Yeah. And we'll talk about a little bit more of this in a second, but I wanna keep going. Other questions? Cool. So again, this is where, as we start to build out these kind of different processes, this is where you start seeing so many of these terms. A little bit of today is uh, trying to really peel back the, uh, the curtain behind what all these terms mean, how they relate to us as computer scientists, and how they are slightly different than what we think software development is. It's, it's the same but different, right? So when we think about the idea of data mining, Right? The entire idea here is, again, we are dealing with some large amount of data that, again, it's just physically impossible or just like improbable, inefficient to try and source through everything. So what we're looking for is can we find our patterns in some way? Right? Can we reduce the size of our needing to exhaust by only, you know, throwing a dartboard and grabbing a couple of those samples at one time. Now, this is where I want you to kind of begin stewing a little bit. We've done this a few times, right? We did this in knowledge representation. I want you to do it again. Think about two or three different areas, right? Just areas, again, this is something I, I was talking to a student during office hours today of like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing the AI concentration. What other courses outside of computer science should I do? And my suggestion was something you want to use AI in, right? What's, you know, again, I've talked about this a few times. Do you want to do it in healthcare? Do you want to do it in education? Do you want to do it in finance? Do you want to do it in defense and security, right? Find the area that you would like to do AI in, or at least kind of data mine, or, you know, analyze. So think about those, right? Think about those areas. Those are your interests. Those are the reasons why you want to, you know, be in this. If you want to just use it in software engineering, cool. Again, that's not uh, the end of the world. But again, think about those. Keep those stewed in your brain because now, as we talk about everything in the next kind of few slides, you'll start to piece together, right? You'll, you'll start to see, hey, I am trying to predict this thing, right? If I'm thinking healthcare, I'm trying to predict cancer. If I'm thinking finance, I'm trying to predict the next Dogecoin, or I don't know, what's what's the, anyone into the crypto spaces? No? Okay. Look, I just need a little bit. Just, <laughs> just tell me where the next one is. I swear I'll make it back. My point being, right? Again, 
or finding trends, right? Uh, you know, if we're thinking about this instead of it being from a financial standpoint, from a business standpoint, hey, what kind of customers am I seeing on my website, right? Your Amazon, well, you've got a lot of shopping behaviors. Are those shopping behaviors similar to other people? So either way, again, as we're starting to look at this, what we form is essentially this idea of data and data objects, right? Again, this is something you've seen. This is an Excel spreadsheet, right? This is a CSV, a comma separated value file. It's a table, right? But the key thing here is that each one of those rows, right, is its own individual object. You would instantiate them, again, you know, however you want to do that for your program. But each one of those columns becomes an attribute for that particular record. Okay, fine. Haven't done anything outlandish, right? That's, again, uh, all of the different kind of structures going on here, right? But specifically, we need to start talking about that data, especially those attributes. Because, well, if you notice, right, those attributes were a few different things. Sometimes they were identifiers. Sometimes they were Boolean values. Sometimes they were strings, right? But, and they could be other things as well. But specifically, that becomes a major thing that we have to focus in on when we're trying to do machine learning. Right, is, well, what kind of data am I working with? And that's where we break it down into four separate categories, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Nominal. The entire idea here is that this is categories, specifically. So when I think about eye color, I got four eye colors on the board right now, right? Brown, blue, hazel, red. Halloween just happened. We can have red eyes. My point being is because I put brown on top, does that make it the best one? Yes, clearly, because I have brown eyes. No, my point being is there's no inherent order to these, right? Hazel, blue, you know, red, it doesn't, there's no which one is better except for you like trying to insert which one is the better one, right? What's the worst one? Oh, well, you're now associating it to demonic stuff or something, right? Now, which one's the worst one, right? Still brown. <laughs> no, my point being is that's where we get into nominal data, right? Just a category. But then we get into ordinal, right? Ordinal. The way I want you to start thinking about this is, have you started getting the emails? No? You know what I mean, right? The end of the semester? Yes. What kind of emails am I talking about? Course evaluations, right? Hey. Not either. You know the good old-fashioned Likert scale that you're all familiar with, that even after you answer, they still send it to you. By the way, please, once you finally get them, I need to please tell me I'm good. You know. My point being, right? There's an order to this suddenly. However, it's not, you know, when we think about it, what's the difference between sort of disagree and neither disagree nor agree, right? Oh, we all understand, like, there's context to that, but, like, quantifiably, where's the context? That's where we actually have to start going into intervals, right? That's where, oh, now temperature suddenly is where this starts to come into play or something that has a very clear numerical value to it. Calendar days also fall into interval because, again, if you think about it, uh, something is one day after another, right? Or something is seven days 
in the future. You have a very clear cut, like numerical uh, estimation going on there. And that's where then we also get into ratio, right? So again, these were mostly categorical, categorical with some value to it. But now we're really focusing in on those values. Something can be bigger or smaller. Now something can be a certain, you know, how much bigger or smaller, right? Something can add a little ratio to this. Something can be twice the size. It's kind of hard to say something is, you know, twice the number of weeks away. That doesn't make really any sense. But if I said something was twice as tall as something else, oh, that, that connects a little bit easier. So as we start to do this, though, one of the things about data science and machine learning, it is heavily influenced by statistics, right? So as we start to look at this, you can see those same categories. What can I do based on the data type, right? One of the strongest problem, uh, one of the biggest issues that we see in statistics is people lying with statistics. We'll talk about that in our ethics lecture, but specifically, you got to make sure you're doing the right one. Otherwise, you know, you're doing it wrong. You're essentially just doing it wrong. So again, as we're looking through these things, you know, again, you should not be trying to do the mean on strongly disagrees, right? That is not, you're, you're, you're dealing with ordinal data, but again, that is not something that you should be working through or with, right? And so a better way, or not a better way, but a different way to view this, right, is again, as we're looking at those different data types, how do you kind of make that assessment? I could just list them all out, but again, you gotta walk away from my examples into your personal examples, right? So when we're dealing with nominal, that's distinctiveness. And what's distinctive mean? It means equal or not equal. What color are my eyes? Do they equal brown or do they not equal brown? Right? That's where distinctness comes in. As we move into more complex data, we still keep distinctiveness, right? That still still uh, exists there. But now we're adding in the concept of order. So now we're adding in whether or not something is greater than or less than. There is order to these things, right? What does that order mean? Well, we haven't established really value to order yet. We've just stated that there is value. That's where interval comes into play. Now I can make a difference based on, let's add one. Like again, if we think about a calendar day and said, let's add one day, we understand exactly where we are, right? And that's again where then when we add in to this idea of multiplication, again, what I'm talking about is I have the ability to say something is twice or half the size of other things. I can now use, you know, these larger scale terms uh, to scale these things. And again, this is where we start to get into a few different pieces, right? The idea, we've talked about this a few times, but discretization, this entire idea that, hey, I have discrete attributes or continuous attributes, right? Discrete, there's a finite number. Eye color, for example, there's a finite number, right? However, here's where I'm gonna make your brain hurt. I am showing you currently, and the generally accepted way to do eye color. Just spitball on this one. Someone suggests like how you would make eye color continuous. RGB, right? RGB still kind of has it in the 0 to 255 space, so it's still discretized, but you're getting there. Hmm? Hex. Hex, again, so now we're hitting, why I'm kind of presenting this is you're right and not right at the same time. It's not, a, not meaning to be a mean thing. Like, the idea is, 0 to 255, 255 to the third power 
still has a finite number to it. Hex still has, what is that, 16 to the sixth power? Uh, fixed number to it. Remember, fractions, decimal points to it. And so the, the idea that I'm thinking about here in my head, right, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, right? Based on wavelength, yeah. So wave, analog, right? And in fact, yes, you know, that's where if we start thinking about RGBs and hex and what they're really dealing with. And by the way, uh, Dr. Chris Healy here at NC State, this is like his entire research is like the theory of colors. Did you know you could just be a theory, you know, you could have a theory of colors? You could just, that, you could be a doctor, just, I really want to be interested in colors. Wild, yes. In all possible colors. Yes. I'm going to just keep going, though. <laughs> at this point, we have, like, we've, we, the more of what I'm trying to get at is these have discretized essentially the, the wavelengths that we are seeing from light as light's being shown out there in the world. Uh, at which point, right, that's where we hit contiguous, uh, continuous. Uh, height, again, same kind of thing, right? How far do you go with your decimal places uh, of just height, right? We round up by saying, you know, X feet, X inches, but is that perfect? No, right? It, then it becomes 1.5 inches or 1.52 inches. Um, either way, uh, just as sort of a quick little questionnaire, right? Uh, if we're looking at these discrete or continuous, a zip code. Discrete, continuous. Right? Your left, discrete. Your right, continuous. Okay, good. A lot of, yeah, yeah, discrete for zip code. Height, width. Or, uh, height, <laughs> discrete, continuous. Yeah, we just talked about that, right? Uh, employee ID, discrete, continuous. I would look at this one as being discrete. Uh, again, you can have an infinite number. I can see that. But this is now where it's kind of like it falls back into that idea of what's the purpose of the data, right? Continuous isn't just meaning, uh, uh, again, we can have a, when we think uh, discrete, Yes, we're adding one to our employee IDs, but again, just because that's infinite doesn't necessarily mean it's a negative or it automatically defaults to um, continuous. Again, think if I were to add a decimal point to this, if, is this something I would add a decimal to? Uh, counts, discrete, continuous. Infinitely countable, we just talked about, right? Uh, a set of words in a collection of documents. Good, yeah, that was also discrete. Temperature in Celsius. Oh, okay, yeah, you're starting to get there, you're starting. Uh, wait, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So again, you're starting to pick these things up, but again, the reason why is because we have to understand what our data is Otherwise, we can't do all of our algorithms, right? Certain algorithms are designed for certain types of data. So that actually gets into the differences. So where we used to work, and it's not that we don't do this now, but specifically this is still something that we have to, again, I call it the shape of my data, right? Again, what kind of data are we looking at? You know, what's the, you know, uh, uh, the type of attribute we're working with. Is it discrete, continuous, ordinal, nominal? Is it structured? Is it in that nice little table format that you, we all learned and loved and, oh, you know, this is Excel all over again, right? Well, again, that's structured. That is 
nice, that, that has kind of a, a core order and structure to it, right? But we are really kind of looking, or the thing that we're most interested in these days is known as unstructured data, right? What is that? It's an airplane, right? It looks like an airplane. Very terrible pixelation. So, like, what's, how are you making the assessment that it's an airplane? Then just think about that. There's no answer to that. It is, in fact, an airplane, right? Audio, right? Text, all of these start to fall into what we call unstructured data. It's much more of like a stream going on there. It's just, content that's being up here. Notice it's not in like a table format. Yes, even though this is in a grid-like structure and we could turn them into table-like structures, by themselves they're just data floating out there in space. And specifically, this is where we start having hard problems, right? Look at that. That is a bunch of RGB values in a X by, or an N by M uh, uh, sh matrix. You called it a plane, right? Here's a bunch of ones and zeros floating up and down. How did it first get converted from ones and zeros in an analog into a digital format, right? Because again, ones and zeros, that's not ones and zeros, that's waves. Text, right? It's, it's text. How, how, what's, there is no definition to any of these things. This becomes a major issue. This is the current hype, is what I'm trying to get at, right? Unstructured data, this is, you know, you want to really, you know, stretch and flex your, your, your AI skills. It's trying to tackle this problem, right? It's not that this problem ha doesn't exist anymore, or that is, you know, easier. It is easier, but it, it's still also quite important. This is the current challenge. This is where what we are trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Think about just those modern problems that when you watch Google or OpenAI and what they're showcasing these days, right? I speak into a phone and it automatically translates my words from English into Spanish, right? That's unstructured data. That is somehow my audio that needs to somehow get converted into text, that needs to somehow get back converted into potentially different audio, right? That's the hype. That is, that is why people are really pushing for these types of things. But as a consequence, that's also incredibly difficult, as you've probably learned so far. And this is also where we have to deal with data quality, right? Again, we are going to start messing around with the data later, right? Thursday, uh, Wednesday, we will start looking at algorithms. This is much more about just evaluating things. And so when we're thinking about it, right, again, one of the major issues is noise, right? When you type, are you perfect? No, I saw that. <laughs> That's a... <laughs> That is someone who makes a lot of typos all over the place, uh, right? Or, you know, you just don't spell the word correctly, and then, you know, you see the red squiggly, but you just hit enter anyway, right? Oh, well, that's noise, right? What do I do with noise? Do I completely throw out the data? Do I change how I do it? Or, again, thinking about it from a picture perspective, right? I may have clean images. Well, what's it mean to be a clean image, right? Just Oh, it's not blurry. There's not things in the way, right? Again, you know, if you're, if I were to, I'll do it like this. If I were to lift a finger, right? You know, again, there's noise in the way. There's something blocking the actual information going on here. <sighs> Right? That's the point I'm trying to get at is, again, this is something is disruptive of the data. Either there's things in the way. Uh, I got a picture of my nephew that currently has a little, you know, logo of some photographer on there, right? So I can't just, like, have the picture for free, right? That's noise. It's in the way. 
But that's also, you know, again, that's from picture perspectives. What about audio? Again, this thing's listening all the time. Who here has an Alexa? You got it? It's fine. I don't, right? It's listening all the time, right? So what's happening? Well, there's just ambient noise. Everyone shut up. You hear all of that noise that's just going on? Someone's laptop is just like blasting. I think it's yours, right? But all that is being recorded, picked up by our Pezio chips that are developing sound or, you know, or uh, running through the pulse code modulations to translate audio into signal or signal into data. At some point, okay, Google, hey, Siri, Hey, Alexa, right? It has to be listening 24. You have to be listening 24-7 until something like triggers your, you know, someone's talking to me kind of thing. Again, that's noise. It's just kind of data that's not doing anything. And even then, right, when I think about that, what happens if when I say hello or OK Google or hello or hey, Alexa, if someone else is talking at the same time or just to use the, the wind turbine beside me, right? What happens when the wind turbine's also happening, right? If there's too much noise, we can't figure out the statement. If there's only a little bit, how do I separate that from, again, you were talking uh, like different waves, right? Not, it's not just one single wavelength, it's actually multiple wavelengths happening at the same time. That same thing is happening with sound. Also, what happens if we just get data that is completely different from the norm for whatever reason? These are what we refer to as outliers. For whatever reason, as we're kind of working through our data, as we make our collections, a single data point, a single person, a single thing in just my whole space is just floating by itself. So what do I do with this, right? This is where we start to kind of get to the, the more nitty gritty. This is actually the pre-processing phase, right? It's not just, oh, I need to load things into a program. It actually is, hey, what do I do with this? Do I keep it and skew my results because it's just one data point, but as you, we do like a comparison to a whole lot of people who are very clearly close and linked together, do I keep you and cause everything to slightly shift over insignificantly, but oh, the head shake, right? Yeah, and in fact, what we will do, right? This is in the pre-processing. When you find outliers, you delete them. Now, you explicitly state you delete them. You're not trying to hide the truth. You are, you know, again, this is from a statistics standpoint. You talk about why you remove the outliers. You state that, uh, you know, you try and find reasons of why. An example that I had uh, for my first research that I did here at grad school was I had a student who didn't know how to program at all trying to do a programming study. Uh, they were also very uh, technologically illiterate. Again, they were just not very good with their computer. And so as a consequence, while everyone else was able to solve this problem in 30 minutes, it took them three hours. Do I keep them in and skew essentially my group that are kind of like each other? Or do I omit and state, hey, I omitted this person or this individual from my study because X, Y, and Z. I omitted them from my study because X, Y, and Z. Uh, but why we do this is also, this is sometimes when we're dealing with it, that becomes a benefit, right? Sometimes you omit it because you're trying to study, you're trying to find information, trying to find the patterns. But again, if we think about that idea of patterns, when we see outliers or anomalies, that is actually an indicator, or it can be an indicator that, hey, my data is not, things are not what they should be. And so this is where, uh, again, this is, outliers can be used for credit card fraud because who here uses a credit card? 
Right? It's not the end of the world. I admit, right? I swipe, and I have a certain pattern to my shopping behavior. Why? Because I'm human, and I have a certain routine that I follow. I don't always spend the same amount every day, but I probably, you know, follow a format, and there's probably, you know, high points in there as well because, again, right, rent's got to get paid. But what happens if suddenly I needed to, you know, make a, a, a $1,500 purchase, right? That's, okay, $1,500, not a terrible, $15,000 purchase, right? That's where credit card company may be like, hey, that seems weird. You're behaving uh, not uh, as you normally would. Does this mean that I automatically lock your card and, like, you know, freeze your account? Probably, you know, but it doesn't mean that it's completely locked forever, right? It's typically in that sense of like, hey, please call us and confirm you are trying to spend $15,000 right now. Right? That, that's kind of where those things come in. Uh, network intrusion, again, from the security standpoint, right? The same kind of concepts are going on. Activity in a specific area or on a specific microservice that really shouldn't be seeing this kind of activity or memory usage. Congratulations, you see these types of uh, issues going on. And uh, the last one of these falls into, well, what happens if you're just missing data? Right? What do you do then? Right? Uh, you know, I, so we got to go all the way back in time here. Uh, my first study, I was collecting faces for artificial face aging and gait analysis and all that. Well, when you're dealing with faces... We get to everyone's favorite topic, ethnicity. So what do you do when you ask for someone's ethnicity and they wrote American? American's not an ethnicity. Should have said, well, I'm not going to assume, right? Again, because that's that. here we are. We have a problem where it's like, oh, I take my data. The data sheet now says American for something that that is not a category what do I do? Do I make assumptions? Right? I don't see the picture of the face, right? Or I, I don't know. Are they Caucasian? Are they African American? Are they Asian American? Like what what's American? What do you do? What did I do? Oh, well, I don't get to use that data anymore. Right? It becomes an ethical issue if you say, oh, let's change that from what was filled in to what I'm going to make as an assumption. That is not good. Don't do those things. Or they just don't fill it in completely, right? If I asked for height and they just omitted telling me their height, right? You know, what do I do, right? Oh, well, you don't get to have that data. You don't make any assumptions. You don't try. Now, here's where, right? You can omit. You should if you're trying to do analysis on patterns and whatnot. Um, but this is where you can also make some estimations. This is where you get into the tricky gray area, right? If you're dealing with like a person and personal data, something like ethnicity, you definitely should omit. You should not make an estimation, right? That you're, you're tangling way too many webs there. But I will say like I had, I've had to do some estimations of uh, the flow of temperature data, uh, because again, the sensor went off. I, I need to know. I have to have something for my analysis, right? Should you? Oh my God. Again, welcome to the gray area. Just don't lie, and if you can't, don't don't try and make things up. That, that is the ugly truth to it all. I don't have a good answer for this one. There isn't one. My point being, what do you do with duplicate data? Just to keep going, because I see where I am on time. Uh, again, this is where uh, a lot of times you may be bringing in multiple data sources. So again, as you're doing the pre-processing, maybe you have uh, not just like one group of pictures that have images, but you may also need another group of pictures that are different resolution, may not be stored in RGB values, may have a different whole uh, structure to the color mixing uh, that it works off of. Again, this is where, well, what do you do, right? 
Well, you should try and omit your duplicates, again, that same kind of process. It's, you're, you're trying to do the data cleaning phase where you get rid of those duplicates, you remove the outliers anywhere you're missing data, you drop them from your data set. You can try to do noise reduction. Again, that's, that's much more of like, now you have to learn signal processing and go through an entire normalization process uh, beforehand. But again, this is like your, your Again, you're just focusing on that cleaning aspect. Um, but why do we do all this stuff, right? That was all just like the beforehand. We haven't done any algorithms, right? This is, well, now what do you want to do? Well, the first one you've got is supervised learning. The idea is I want to do some kind of prediction. I want to do some type of I don't know, but given my observations, what should happen? And that kind of boils back down into this idea of classification or re uh, regression. What we're talking about here is, again, let's look at, say, for example, uh, two separate text messages, right? Given that these are two separate texts, if I wanted to look at them, how is it that I establish that one of these is spam, or sorry, not spam, ham. This is mostly the joke of spam detection tutorials out there everywhere, right? Not spam or spam. Like, what is it about these? And we'll, we'll just for the sake of time, we'll, you know, I won't ask about them. But again, right, you get a number. How do you know if it's spam or not, right? We can't just make the cheeky joke of, oh, because I don't have it saved in my contacts, right? That's not really acceptable. Uh, so again, how is it that we make those predictions? When we think about regression, again, it's still trying to make a prediction about something based on its data. Again, we look at the data and we try and identify, hey, what's the, again, if I'm dealing with multiple points of data, is there a way that I could split the data, right? Again, this is pedal width, pedal length, because we're talking, uh, or most commonly you'll see that the iris data set is used uh, out there on the internet to try and describe these things. But again, well, you notice, hey, I, I have a very clear, you know, two separate lines where all of one type of iris, uh, flower, uh, just happens to exist, right? Again, that's, that's kind of where uh, those spaces exist. But that's just one type of category. That is supervised learning. Again, we will come back to that next class, but then after we've done a bit of supervised learning, we'll talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. Now, right, there's nothing, there's no label. There's nothing out there that says this is spam or not spam. There is none of that stuff. All we are trying to do is, hey, I have a stream of data. Can you identify the patterns? I don't know what the patterns are. I don't have labels for the patterns but can you describe them to me? And that's where we break things down again into this idea of like clustering, trying to find the like-minded groups or uh, uh, dimension reduction uh, in that kind of sense. That's, can we find something called latent variables? We'll talk about those later. But again, as we're starting to look at it is I just have, you know, we'll, you know I'm gonna keep using the Amazon shopping data. I know I'm talking about two-dimensional planes here. Um, but let's just imagine that that data, right, th those are customers shopping behaviors somehow magically morphed into a two-dimensional plane, right? Well, you can see that, hey, you know, this is a cluster. This is a group of people who seem to be shopping the same way. There's a lot of people shopping the same way over here, very dense population, a little sparse here. The analogy that I've used in the past is, let's imagine that this is students and this is teachers, right? We both share some of the similar shopping behaviors, right? You are buying school supplies because you are in school. I am buying the same school supplies because I am also technically in school. Who here has dry erase markers, right? We both are gonna be very closely linked uh, on Amazon because we share similar shopping behaviors. However, I'm older than you, right? I buy a lot of knee braces and ice packs and things. 
because it hurts. I got a crink in my neck this week. Well, guess what? That means, right, your shopping behaviors are going to mirror those of most likely 20-year-old college students. Mine are mirroring those of 40-year-old college goers, right? Because, I mean, it's true, right? Again, just differences in behavior. So we're the same. We're very closely linked, but we're not. We're completely different groups. Then we keep on going. We again have something known as dimension reduction. We'll have an entire lecture on this uh, that I'll spend a lot more time on. I just want to kind of get to, uh, we don't have enough time for this, so I apologize if you did fill out that form. Uh, good. I really don't have, I only have 15, 14 more minutes, so I'm going to just skip this. So, why we kind of do this. All, now what we've got is, okay, we're doing the classification. At least we're focusing in on the classification section, right? What's our end goal? Well, we're trying to find a model that can do it well, right? That's, we're trying to find an agent, right, model, agent, that is able to make a decision very well. Now it's no longer, oh, I'll, you know, if the agent does it, is successful 70% of the time, right? We're trying to find something that where it is, right? Oh, can I find an agent that is 70%? Well, I can find an agent that's doing it 80% of the time. Okay, can you find one that does it 81% of the time? Can I find a better agent? That's what we're starting to look at here. So as we're starting to kind of work through our data, again, we have our categories, but then we may also have some form of class label. Right now, our goal is well. Given that I have observed X, and this is not uh, again logic. This is not meant to be an implications. Right, it's meant to simply just be. Hey, given my data, can I tell you what Y is? Can I accurately produce the Y value in a row? And so, how do we do that? Well, again, this is that pre-processing stage. We're still kind of running through all of the uh, shifting and evaluating our data, but we would take our data set and we'd separate it into two groups, potentially three groups depending on uh, your methodology, right? A training group and a testing group. So the idea behind them, uh, there are multiple types that you want to work off of. So again, the biggest one that I'll, I'll kind of suggest is if you start working in the data science machine learning space, the first task you could work off of is using your, your training set as your test set. Well, that is referred to as a sanity check. How well do you, are you able to predict the stuff that you were trained on, right? If you can't do that, your model's broken. Your model doesn't work. Something's wrong, right? Because you should have seen this stuff. But then you start getting into the other realistic cases, right? Supply test case sets are often used in competitions, um, but when you're doing something for simply research kind of perspective, you will split them yourself manually. Uh, how that kind of starts to fall into place, though, is that you start getting into how do I evaluate if my model is good? Now, specifically, where we start to kind of focus at least on a binary, you know, yes or no, true or false standpoint, is we get into mapping, okay, well, is it correct? And if it is correct, right, is it that it was correctly identifying something, correctly not identifying something, or incorrectly identifying something, or incorrectly not identifying something? Right? So we get into a lot of our, this is where you start hearing about your type 2 uh, errors or false alarms. Right? Again, they all start to have their own little conversation. But why I'm you know, uh, trying to get to this spot is because how do we start to evaluate them? Right? Well, the first one we deal with is something known as accuracy. Right? Oh, well, I've tested, I, I, I produced you know, my, my model, I made some kind of predictions, well, how accurate was it, right? That's generally our first question. And what you would do is go, oh, let me grab all the times that it was accurate, right? And then just compare it to our number of trials. That is accuracy, right? So not necessarily uh, outlandish, but the problem with accuracy is uh, it may not be good enough. 
right? Accuracy uh, can kind of skew things a little bit because what if I just give it a whole bunch of, you know, false or, or true negatives, right? I'm trying to make a, a prediction of something if something is a cat. Well, I can make a model be very accurate by just giving it a lot of pictures that are not cats, right? Uh, just here's a bunch of not cat pictures that I will absolutely just always result to false, right? Congratulations, I can, I can make a really high accuracy because of that, because again, those are true negatives are in the numerator. So we say, hey, accuracy is not that great. So we start looking at other things that try and omit that true negative. We're trying to now look at things like precision. And the entire idea here is now we're only focusing on when it was essentially the green light. Yes, we're now only talking about cats when we see that cat. If we have a picture of a cat here, you detect it. Oh, congratulations. Good. But then those false positives, false alarms, right? Instead of it being cat, it's cancer, right? Oh, when did you actually detect, you know, a cancerous growth? When did you accidentally detect the cancerous growth, right? That, that is where precision becomes useful. But then recall, on the other times, is this idea, you know, you, you can, as I'm saying here, what happens if I miss, right? This is where it's very important, right? I don't want to miss... Uh, observed cancers or, uh, um, what is it, uh, uh, credit card frauds. I know, you know, credit card is just a financial thing. We can always roll back prices or whatever. Uh, but cancer, again, that's pretty important. Why we do that is then we take both recall and precision. Again, the end game is to get rid of that because accuracy isn't as good as we think it is. Right, F1 is our attempt at saying, here's a better way of evaluating the model while omitting just the, the kind of true negative structure. It's not the best, or rather it is, it is highly contested, but it is the current thing that people, you know, if you show someone an F1 score, they will calm down. They will complain about it not being that, you know, the best way of evaluating, but then they will shut up. So again, as we're starting to kind of look at that, right, again, if we kind of take something like maybe uh, is a text message spam or not spam, right? When I detect it, hey, I have the true detections of when it, it was a normal, I have when it was spam, I have when it was not spam, right? Or you miss connections, miss labels. Well, if we look at that, right, again, if we mapped out every single one of those calculations, well, again, accuracy would make it seem like the model's pretty big, right? 82% uh, accuracy, that's pretty nice. Well, if we then do a comparison on precision, though, right, that's where we get a little bit lower, right? Recall's pretty nice as well, but you can see, hey, even though accuracy is the bigger number, again, accuracy can be spoofed by the true negatives, right? Uh, maybe flipping spam and ham around. More to my point is, again, it may not be the best in comparison to other models, right? What happens if I had a different model, right? In this case, again, I'm just gonna work with it through you, so please wake up so that you can help me with the math because we only got about six, seven minutes, right? Okay, well, again, if I'm looking at this model, right, I have, I want to uh, do accuracy. Well, accuracy is pretty straightforward, right? Accuracy is I add all the numbers up and I, I'm only factoring in the, the, you know, ham, ham, spam, spam. So that's 17 plus 15 over 17 plus 15 plus 3 plus six, right? 32 over 32, 41, is that right? Okay. Uh-huh. 
roughly 0.7805. That was just around there, right? Okay, fine. Precision. What's used? Huh? The hams. So we got the 17 plus the 16. Not 16, the 6. Over. Sorry. There we are. 17 plus the 6. 17 divided by 23. Point seven three nine. Just to now, kind of keep the same structure there. Uh, recall. Actual ham. Actual ham. So this becomes seventeen over seventeen plus three or 17 divided by 20, which becomes, because I don't know that math on time, and I'm trying to get through these, 0.85, right? And then we get to the F1, right? Again, I'm just now speeding through these a lot more. I apologize, right? Mm -hmm. If we're looking at F1, Again, what we are doing is we are going to take precision and recall, and we are going to run this formula. So it becomes two, becomes two times, uh, what are we doing here? Recall 0.85 times precision 0.7, I'll just round to four, right? Over. 0.85 plus 0.7. You type in all of that. That's a 0.85 plus 0.74. That becomes 1.59. Two times point. That is point uh, 0.85 times 0.74. One point two five eight, and that's going to equal an F one score of point seven nine. I broke it. Ta da! Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So again, uh, again, I apologize. I, 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 too much time, so I, I, I'm just kind of ra ramping through the rest of this. Um, so again, how do you validate your models? Again, I did all of this stuff. The last sort of stage that you're doing with this, again, I see where I am on time. I will finish on time. I, I, I'm critical on time. Again, what we focus in on is, OK, well, again, when I want to do my analysis, if I only focus on my test set and I, I pick and cherry pick, again, this is how you're lying with statistics, right? Where should I divide my, my contents? That's where what you oftentimes see is something called k-fold cross-validation, where you will divide into a certain number of partitions. Uh, and essentially, again, you will assign certain partitions to be your training set, be your test set, but then you will do the whole process that many times, right? Because again, which one are you testing on based on your training? You are going to split. So that blue is essentially the test set off of in what we would can call a tenfold cross-validation. I got 30 seconds. What you would do? You would go and you would take all of those scores, so the accuracy, the precisions, the recalls, all of that, you'd add them all together, and you'd take the average. And that would give you the k-fold cross-validation accuracy. And I finished on time. Get out of here.
I will see y'all on Wednesday. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. We are in a capitalist society. Again, he chose to buy the turbine.